devices. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon everyone. We are sitting in a light bit of drizzle at the moment. There was a rainbow over there, I promise you that, but this is Safari Live. Good afternoon again everyone, my name is Byron and on camera with me this afternoon is Fergus. Now, <laughs> you may have seen Tristan on the other vehicle, he's with Craig and then of course we've got Alice and Chantal in the final control. We're waiting to hear from the team in the Mara to see if they're going to be joining us this afternoon. But don't forget we are live everyone, so please send us your questions and comments at hashtag Safari Live via Twitter, that's how you get hold of us and we'd love to answer your questions. Um, now, it is a bit of a drizzle at the moment, and oh, we've got a bit of a drizzle. Now, as I said, there was a rainbow. That was there, and that's why Fergus and I were laughing, because it seems like nothing wants to stick around for us at the moment. We had a bit of a quiet morning. You can see a faint rainbow just over that tree, just over there. There's a little bit of a rainbow. It was a lot brighter earlier, but it it's disappearing slowly but surely. Well, hopefully our luck increases or improves rather um, during the course of the drive <clears throat> this morning. Um, it was actually a fairly quiet morning. We tried to find some wild dogs. We tried to find leopard, but we didn't have much luck. Hopefully, a little bit later, we'll see some animals some predators but I do think the weather the weather has played a big role in in the animals laying low at the moment it's cold it's windy and it's now starting to drizzle which is not ideal so we've got our rain covers on but um, we're gonna continue down south and see what we can find let's head across to Tristan who would like to say good afternoon to you Well, we would indeed, Byron, and we found your missing rainbow. It's faintly in the distance there. It's not a very impressive one at this stage. It all is quite faint, and it hopefully will get a little bit brighter. And we can't show you the full extent of our rainbow, unfortunately, because as you can see, we have our rain covers on, because the rain is coming. Now, as Byron said, my name is Tristan, and on camera today, I've got Craig, aka the Batman, and it is a rainy, windy afternoon, and hopefully the wind and rain will bring us a little more luck than what we had this morning. At least towards the end of drive things started to change and there was a report that Tingana came onto Juma. So I'm heading in that direction trying to see if I can't find Tingana for ourselves. Now remember this is live, it is interactive and you the viewers are the most important part and so we would love to hear from all of you. Remember you can use hashtag Safari Live on Twitter for the new viewers and for the old viewers well if you've got any things to say or hello or anything like that you're more than welcome and new viewers We'd love to hear any questions that you have, or just a hello from wherever you may be. Right, Craig, since we're a bit hampered with our view of the rainbow, I think it's time to move on and to try and get towards Buffelzook Dam with haste, because we all know Tingana loves to get onto his feet and walk quite fast, and so we are going to have to probably mobilize a little bit to get there ourselves. Now, he did cross earlier today, at around 10 o'clock, was apparently the time that he came across onto our side and towards Biffles Hook Dam and so we're going to try and see if we can't just get into that area and try and find him. I'm hoping with this miserable weather that we've got today with the rain and the wind and the coolness of the day that hopefully he's just found himself a place to curl up and digest his warthog that he killed yesterday. Um, and that's where we, we, our sort of hope lies. Otherwise, I think it's going to be a tough afternoon to find him. It's right up on the border, and he could have gone either back into Torchwood or into Buffleshook. We know Tingana likes to move around quite a bit, so let's just hope that he's decided to have a bit of a rest. Well, hello, Impalas. We have one Impala. Well, we had an Impala. Now, of course, with our roofs, it's a little bit more difficult to be able to show you everything that's around us, but we shall try. And this impala is quite interesting. It looks like it's got a really nasty scar on the back of its head. 
I don't know what's happened to it, but it's got a sort of bald patch on the back of the head. You can see, oh no, don't run away now. There's another male impala behind him, that's why he's running. But I wonder what's on the back of his head. It could be a scarring from a fight. When these males fight like this, sometimes the horns hit and it causes an abrasion to happen and they wear all their fur off. He also has a, looks like a scar on his neck where possibly a horn hits him. So he's been roughed up a little bit and that's maybe why he's just in a small group with another male and in a small little bachelor grouping. But let's just see. I'm going to try to get forward again. Like I say, with the sides of these roofs, it makes it quite tough to be able to actually, there we go, Craig, I don't know if you can get that. I'm going to try and see, I think the angle might be a bit tight on, for Craig. So let's just try and move around a little bit. No, don't move now, stay there. There we go. Okay, I think Craig will be able to find us there. So it's this front impala here that's got the scarring on the back of his head. There we go, you see it there? It's just a black mark behind the ears and at the base of the horns. There we go. I think he was impaled by a horn there and then there was a bit of an infection that probably developed and that's why it's gone. You can actually see there's the wound. Do you see it? He's got a couple wounds there and this is what happens to impalas when they fight over females and, and, and they try and get into this rutting phase. You get this happening fairly commonly. There's lots of injuries that will be around the face, the neck area and there'll be cuts and scrapes and it seems like this guy's done really well to actually heal back from it and eventually the fur will grow back you won't have a bald patch for the ever but he's definitely going to have a nice scar there for the next little bit shame boy it's been a rough r mating season for you and that brings me to happy father's day for all the viewers that weren't with us this morning it is father's day here and we would like to wish all the fathers a very very happy day including my dad who i haven't been able to get hold of today i've been trying to phone him but he hasn't answered his phone so i'm going to try and see if i can't get him after drive but Happy Father's Day to you too, Dad. It's been always a pleasure to be a son to my dad. So, right. Now, forward and onward, Tingana, who's a dad of many cubs out here. Let's go see if we can't find him. And let's go across to Byron and see what his plan is for the afternoon. Well, Tristan, my plan is to just try and find some animals this afternoon. And that's it. It's been times animals move off we knew we know that we know that um, uh, Tingana was actually east of our boundary on Torchwood and he had a kill so that would explain why we haven't seen him around for a day or two or a few days um, now I don't know what else we're going to do then we're going to just try and have a look they did say they had tracks of a leopard coming into the area around Biffelzook Dam so I think what I'm going to do is head in that direction and maybe we have some luck with a leopard around there but I think because of this very cool weather a lot of these predators would move around during the day a lot more than they usually would so it could potentially be quite difficult Alright, now I'm going to be going through a little bit of a dip now, so we might lose some signal, but let's head back to Tristan and uh, see what the big boss man has got for us this afternoon. Well, nothing just yet, Byron. We're still making our way generally in a sort of north easterly direction towards where Tingana was last seen and just having a little look as we go. I took the road that goes uh, from Gallego, the shortcut is two shortcuts on Gallego and trying to just see if maybe this fifth lioness from the Incahumas has popped out somewhere here and we find some tracks for her because as far as I know yesterday when they were seen again there was only the four of them so I'm just trying to see where she could be and I was hoping that maybe she'd be lying up somewhere here with that little cub I don't know which lioness it is that has the cub but you never know it was worth just coming to have a look and so hopefully it will be one of those afternoons but no signs that I can see so Milton you want to know how many different lion prides there are in the Kruger 
Well, Milton, I honestly don't know in terms of numbers of prides, but I can tell you that it's many. There's estimated at close to two and a half thousand lions in the Kruger National Park, and there will be prides that will be up to 40, and others that will be small of two, three individuals like the Shimungwe pride. So there is quite a few. But if we take a sort of transect of the Kruger National Park and we say that the Sabi Sands is 60. 4,000 hectares including Mala Mala so that makes about 128,000 acres but the greater Kruger is 8 million acres and we then just sort of work out how many prides we get here we can then kind of factor roughly I mean it's a very rough estimate because certain areas will have more water than others which will allow for a lot more um, a lot more prides in those areas if there's water because there'll be a lot more prey in that area so if you take the sabi sands we probably have now i would say about 11 or 12 prides i'll have to count them and when we come back to us because we're going to go across to byron shortly who's got a herd of impala but when you come back i'll try and work out exactly how many prides we have <laughs> now we um we're sitting with a herd of impala at the moment and they were lying down and it just shows you again this weather how it causes the animals to lie down and probably try and get up and uh, get some shelter now you can see they are quite cold too and if you look at this group of impalas straight ahead of me through here and there we go it looks like you see how dark those impala are looking their backs now oh, that's because they have basically caused the hair on the back they've contracted the muscles in the skin causes the hair on their back to stand up and that traps a layer of air underneath it there you can see it very clearly there look at that and then that acts as an insulation layer to hopefully keep them warm and it's because of this cold wet weather that we're having at the moment <coughs> excuse me I know how you feel little impala it's not very pleasant out here at the moment but then again you can see how close this herd of impala are staying to one another they'll rely a lot on each other now for safety in these conditions because if there are any predators lurking around it would be ideal conditions for them to hunt windy weather the rain causes a lot of noise the impala can't smell them so if they're able to stalk up really close they'd be able to hunt quite easily in weather like this just need to find some predators that are hunting. Nice to see a herd of impala. They're still they're very beautiful antelope. I enjoy seeing the impala. Good food source for many different predators. Sure, it is chilly today. You can see some of them chewing the cud over there. That little impala was busy chewing. So they are ruminants. They regurgitate their food and they rechew it. That's why they've got such an efficient digestive system. break down the food very very well looks like mostly females and you know there are one or two males dotted around within the herd now, and you asked well, what is the visual difference between the impala the springbuck and the gazelle now let me show you quickly uh, the impala you can see I don't need to show you a photo of one. There's an impala right there in front of us Let me find some spring of springbuck for you to show you the difference There we go All right, so you notice that uh, impalas Mostly uniform brown. There's a, a slight uh, shade variation in the back But now this is the springbuck here at the bottom if we have a look at these is that alright? Yeah, Sorry, just the glare on the book there. Um, so if you look here at the bottom, um, as Ferg zooms in, you'll see those are the springbuck. Now notice they also got brown backs, but there's a very thick dark brown stripe through the middle, and then a white belly. Do you see that? Completely different to the impala. 
Impala have got a light underbelly, a white underbelly, but there's um, there's no very prominent dark brown stripe through the middle that you can see over there. And um, they're very light underneath. Also, the springback are much smaller than the Impala. Um, and also, the other interesting thing is with springback, the male and the female have horns. Whereas with the Impala, as you can see, it's only the males that have horns. That's actually a photo of some Impala right up above them. You can see those are the female Impala with no horns. But you can see that uni more of a uniform brown coloration if you have a look at these Impala ahead of us. They do have a bit of a, a divide with a darker brown on top and lighter brown through the middle and then a light underbelly. But very different to that of the spring bucket. It's very clearly white from halfway of the belly right round to the bottom. And that dominant um, uh, dark brown stripe through the middle. Now... I hope that um, Brent and them get a bit or get mobile later and they can hopefully show you some Thompson's Gazelle in East Africa. We don't get them in this area. They look very similar to the Springbuck though. So that white coloration underneath, they do look very, very similar. Fortunately, my book is only of Southern Africa. So we don't get Thompson's Gazelle down here. So I don't have a picture of one. But um, hopefully later in the Mara they can show you what a Thompson's Gazelle looks like. You can see the difference between that and a Springbuck. But they're very, very similar in color. It's the size that's different. The horns are slightly different. Um, but and again, like I said, we don't get them in Southern Africa at all. Well, Tristan's driving along the road and I'm not sure if he's managed to find anything yet. Let's go find out. Well, no, Byron, still driving along, still slowly heading eastwards towards Bufuzuk Dam. We haven't quite got there yet, but I have been doing a bit of a mathematical equation as to how many lion prides we get here in the Sabi Sand. So just to continue from just now, that at the moment currently we have 12 lion prides roughly that you could include within the Sabi Sands. Now those 12 prides are spread across the entire area and some of you may ask why only 12 because there's a few that I've left off for reasons that they are males. Now males I haven't counted in as a pride they are a coalition and we can I suppose count them but in terms of just prides that we know of there are 12. So there is down in the south we have the southern pride which is quite a large pride. We then from there get um, the Eastern Bank Pride, we get the Sparta or Ifield Pride, we get Ottawa Pride, and we get Mangan Breakaway, Mangan, Salala, Salala Breakaway, Inkahuma, Styx, and Talamati, Torchwood, who am I missing? Four ways, so 13 actually, I lie. Now the ones that I've left off are all ones that have unfortunately disappeared in the last few years. So the Charlestons, which are now all males, so there's no real pride left there anymore. Then the Hilda's Rock Pride, as far as I know, is also all gone. Those are all males too. And um, then you've got, who else disappeared? The Shemungwe Pride that disappeared as well. So that gives you a sort of idea of how many lions we have in that area. So if we applied that across the, the whole of the Kruger, somebody who's very, very good with maths, not me, could maybe try and apply that in let's say the 128,000 acres that we're in that we have 13 lion prides how many lion prides would there be in the 8 million acres if you had to divide the two and a half thousand by that so someone who's very clever with maths there you go you can work that out and we can roughly get an idea of how many prides of lions are spread across the Kruger. Of course, it is not exact science in any way, and I'm not saying that you can quote me on that being the exact number of prides that we get within the Kruger Park system, but it's just a rough estimate of what there could be. You must also remember that the Sabi Sands is a predator-rich environment and a prey-rich environment. Because of the two rivers that run in close proximity to each other, it means that there is a lot of prey animals and therefore a perfect place if you are wanting to be a predator. And so this competition for this area is very, very high. If you go up into the northern parts of the Kruger, the lion prides up there, some of them tend to be a little bit larger, but less of the prides up there. I actually saw a post today of prides up there that are 
There's a, the biggest pride in the Kruger now apparently is up in the northern part of Kruger and it's 42 lions strong. Can you imagine seeing 42 lions together? Wouldn't that be exciting? Right, Biffles Hook Dam. Tingana, where are you? Now I know he came here at some point today. It's just now a matter of trying to find out where he is. I'm going to try and see if I can't get hold of the guys and see if they don't know where he is. I can hear some Franklin's alarm calling on the other side. I wonder if he's not in the drainage system or at comes in. So, Larika, you say if we find Tingana, we must wish him a happy Father's Day. Well, yes, I certainly will. I shall tell him happy Father's Day from all of us at Safari Live. Hopefully, he'll be happy to hear about that. And hopefully, he hasn't... Well, he'll continue to produce more little cubs and he'll continue to be a father going forward. It would be quite good if we did produce a few more. And you can see there's one hippo with the rainbow just over the edge of the water there. It's quite cool actually to see the hippo and the rainbow together. Now it's not the most sort of strong rainbow and that's because the light that we've got is not very strong. We don't have bright sunlight, it's just sort of a little bit of light reflecting through that moisture that is in the clouds. But it seems just the one hippo, it's, the hippos in Bufflesook Dam fluctuate all the time and I'm not 100% sure why. I would have thought given the amount of water that we've had or that we have in this area that we should have a stable population of females and a male in here and even if it's a small population of three or four hippos I'm surprised that they're moving in and out of this particular water hole as much as they are. Some days you come here and there's five of them, the next day you come and it's just this one male on his own. It just seems very odd that they're moving around so much could be because they might be bouncing from a different dam so there's a dam that is maybe north of us I know on on Biffles Hook there are a number of large dams up there and it could be that they're moving from that and then they feed their way through the night and just overnight here and then go back that way the next day and that's maybe why we're getting such a fluctuation of hippos within this dam you can see a few of the ox peckers have joined as well they I'm sure are going to be rudely interrupted and have to take off fairly shortly because when sitting on a hippo's head you are going to in all likelihood at some point the hippo is going to go underneath and that means as a bird you are not going with you are going into the air and away so these guys will just have a short little stint on top of the hippo so Francis from Israel you want to know how the birds fare in this weather well I can tell you that the birds won't be they would have been alright had it not been for the rain the rain is not a good start or a good point for them their feathers get very very wet and then you'll find that the birds become thoroughly miserable. You find them sitting on branches all puffed out and just trying to stay dry. The other problem is, is any young birds that we have, and this will apply even to young animals like the impalas and things, with weather like this, when it's cold it's one thing, but rain and cold is a big problem and you'll often get a situation where you'll get young animals or older sick animals that will actually die in conditions like this. A sudden cold snap, their bodies just can't deal with it, particularly if they're weakened in some way and they then pass away from it. So it's going to be a tough few days for some of the animals as well as some of the younger birds that potentially could be around at this time of the year. But the birds themselves will find will be far more grounded if we have a situation where it gets very very rainy then the birds are going to go into a tree and they're going to sit and they're going to spend their sort of day down on the trees themselves. If the rain stops then we'll find that the birds of prey are going to be quite active because the wind is blowing and therefore they can use that wind to hunt very well particularly those that hunt on the wing like the hawks and some of the eagles themselves. And talking of birds there's our Birchall starling ever present on the shores of these particular dams you always see starlings around places like this they like to hang around in areas like this there's lots of insects that come off the water that they can potentially hunt where are you off to starling I'm just trying to stay out of the frame now there we go <laughs> so we're going to try and just see where those Franklins were alarm calling around the other side of the dam we know that these two inlets here and if I was going to be a leopard that's where I would be going so I'm gonna go and check over there and while we do that let's go across to Byron and see where he is and whether or not he's managed to find anything of interest. Now look what we have found, a terrapin out of the water. Now this looks like a serrated um, serrated back terrapin. You can see those, actually you can see the serrations on the back, um, right at the back of the carapace at the, the right, um, there we go, you can just see those curves you can see it clearly serrated back terrapin 
There it goes. Now, it's probably moving around because it would have come... Sorry, my hat's in the way. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, it's a raggedy hat. That <laughs> um, so I think what's happened is um, this uh, terrapin would have moved from one of the little pans, maybe heading to another one. And on a cool day like today, where there's a bit of drizzle, it's, an I it's ideal conditions for it to move around. Now, we don't often see terrapins out the water, so this is quite quite interesting and look at that following the drainage line over here here we go look at that that's very cool it's quite a big one that's about as big as they get maybe a little bit bigger oh that's really interesting so because of this drizzle that we've picked up here you can see these terrapins now some of you might be asking right well what is the difference between a tortoise and a terrapin so the carapace of the terrapin is slightly softer than that of the tortoise and a bit flatter you can see that also the terrapin lives in water um, even though this one's out of water at the moment the terrapins live in water the tortoises live on land and um, and also the terrapins where the tortoises are able to pull their necks or their heads straight back in under their carapace for safety into their shell these terrapins actually move their necks to the side and push their head into the side to cover it up so they don't pull it straight back in so this is basically a freshwater turtle that's what a terrapin is essentially <laughs> Rachel, you say that these terrapins remind you of grumpy old men and you love them. Oh. <laughs> oh, Rachel, now we can't say that on Father's Day. Surely we can't. Happy Father's Day again to everybody, um, wherever you are around the world. You know it is Father's Day, so hope you're celebrating and spoiling your dads. Very interesting little creatures, these terrapins. And you can, if you listen carefully, listen to the rain on our roof. Francis from Israel, you say he's a long way home. Now, Francis, is that, are you a long way from home or is the terrapin? <laughs> I'm just joking. You're right, Francis. He is, he is a long way from home. I wonder, but it just shows you they do move around a lot. Oh, sorry, Alice, if you could just repeat Tanya from Australia's question. Um, I mean, what was in the rain? Oh, Tanya from Australia, you asked, what does Juma smell like in the rain now. Now, again, you've you you asking me these questions that James likes to answer because his descriptions of the smell are a lot better than than mine. And I always <laughs> people always tease me about my descriptions because they're not very good. Now, um, the smell of Juma at the moment in this rain. Now, is is that wonderful word called petrichor? Now, petrichor is the smell of rain on the earth when it hits the earth you know that very fresh sandy that's fresh soil smell the moisture in the air that's called petrichor now there is a bit of that at the moment um, and also what's nice is it settled all the dust so we don't have that real um, quite or a lot of dust at the moment so this little bit of drizzle just helps some of the dust settle which is great so what else what can you smell Fergs? Sort of herbal, sort of smell of the trees. Yeah, yeah, a bit of a bit of a herbal smell, I suppose, as Fergus was was saying, with the the trees at the moment. It's got a got a herbal scent to it with the with the moisture because of the green trees around, especially this area, this drainage line. I think we still got a lot of green trees around here.
But definitely, definitely that earthy smell, that uh, um, wet soil, earthy smell. It's a lovely smell. It's one of my favourites, actually. No, oh, quite a sandy smell over there. Wow, now look at this dark cloud heading our way. That that looks like trouble. If you don't see me on tomorrow's drive, that's why. <laughs> No, Izzy, rain this time of the year is, is wonderful for the dry season. It's very welcome. Um, just because it, it just adds a little bit of moisture to everything. It settles the dust. Um, the animals are then able to get a bit more moisture. It it doesn't really make a difference. This is not going to be a heavy rain, I don't think. Oh, famous last words. <laughs> Judging by those clouds in the back. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, but as you know, it, it's, it would definitely be be welcomed if anything, you know, any bit of moisture or rain in Africa is always welcome. So so this is great for this time of year, unusual, but I think it's a bit of a front that's probably come through and brought a bit of rain with it. Now, unfortunately, it's not raining the right part of the country. We need rain down in the Cape and down in the south, um, western part of South Africa, down in Cape Town. It's been very very dry there. And um, they've been hit with some really bad fires, um, so hopefully they get some rain soon, because there are also water shortages there. So that area of South Africa really needs a lot of rain. There's some impala just over here. I'm just enjoying the a bit of the moisture. You can see grooming themselves, but they do look a little cold still. No, oh, that cloud looks serious dark cloud that's approaching. America, you asked if the, the animals are more active while it's raining. No, not necessarily. Um, I have ever seen animals moving around in the rain and I've seen predators moving around in the rain but um, but generally I've also seen if it rains very hard the animals do go and kind of look for shelter and they, they'll try and lie under the branches of trees. I've seen, we've seen male lions, and I think it was earlier this year we saw one of the big Birmingham males, the big coalition of males that we have around here. Um, we saw one of the males uh, lying in the, <laughs> shame, he was trying to lie under a tree, but it was pouring with rain. And we sat with him for about half an hour, and he just sat and he hunkered down, and he was just sitting in the rain. He wasn't enjoying it very much at all. So generally the animals won't won't move around as much in heavy rain. Probably stick to an area, stick close together for safety. Some of the predators might, but also go and look for go and look for um for shelter. But if it's light drizzle like this it comes and goes they will still move around. Anyway, let's uh let's head back to Tristan, find out how he's doing in the rain and if he's hunkered down. Well, we're doing just fine. It hasn't started to rain. The smell of Juma in the rain is quite something. It is pretty. It smells good. It smells fresh. It's always nice after a dusty period to smell the rain. Now, you may wonder what I'm doing driving around in this horrible little area that we're in. Well, this is where Tingana was seen. I found the vehicle tracks where they came in and they followed him to this area and apparently he was left sleeping somewhere here. So I'm just trying to check under all these bushes. I can hear Franklins that aren't that happy around here. So just trying to see if I can't see him. Of course, the roof is making it a little bit difficult because I can't actually see that much around me. All I can see is this sort of front section so I'm just trying to look around and hope that he's not lying here somewhere they did tell me that he was very full yes 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 I'm sorry Franklin's you can hear the Franklin's <laughs> are very upset that I disturbed them and they've probably had a tough day between a leopard and now us 
this is what happens is we get quite a bit of noise happening so these are all Natal Franklins that are in front of us and moving around and they sort of making the squawking sound because I've just come over the rise and I think they got a massive fright with me just appearing on top of this hill while they were in the bottom here but alas I don't see any sign of Tingana now they said he was just on this northern side here, so I wonder if it's not worth just going around. There's another road that goes around on the other side, and it could be the perfect place to go and actually check. This little riverbed system that we're in here is not easy to see what's going on, so I think I'm going to back out of this and then take the road that goes round and just check on the other side there. Now, of course, it wouldn't be that easy with Tingana. It never is. He never just lies right out in the open where you can see him. And so I'm sure we're going to have to try our level best to actually find where this naughty leopard has headed off to. He always makes it a little bit of a challenge to find him. So I'm going to try and see if I can't find some sort of sign on the northern bank. Let's see if there aren't any footprints here. No, nothing that I can see there. Doesn't look like he walked this direction. Hmm. Let's carry on a little bit and just go see, Craig. But apparently he drank from here and then went just in a lay and he was big, full belly that he was sort of fat and wanted to lie down. But I Apparently our signal's not good where we are. This is also another gremlin hollow. So while we try and negotiate our way out of this, let's go back across to Byron and we'll try and see if we can find Tingana. All right, well, good luck, Tristan, um, in that area. Hopefully you find a male leopard around there. Uh, one day he could possibly be lying in one of the drainage lines. It's quite a thick area. So hopefully Tristan has some luck. There is I was just having a look around now and, and both Fergus and I were saying there's beautiful, there's a bit of sunlight coming through and this light at the moment is spectacular for photography. If we manage to find a subject and photograph it in this light I think we'd have some really great images especially with these dark clouds in the background around us. So picture um, let's say a lion or a leopard a leopard on a termite mound with these this beautiful light hitting it and those dark clouds in the background that's really amazing amazing shot that I think we could get there so now we just need to find a leopard quickly <laughs> Oh, John, the trees definitely change colour in our autumn winter. Hold on a second. Let me just jump out here. Look at this. Let me jump out right here. Oh. Now, John, you can see these trees have all changed colour. Um, let me, let me. <laughs> it's too high for me. <laughs> but have a look at these branches and these trees. This is a little bush willow. And now this bush willow, you can see there's a lot of brown, there's yellow, there's, um, uh, there's almost like an orangey color, a bit of green. But John, they all change color. Well, not all of them, actually. These trees, the bush willows change color. And you can see, if you look around us at the moment, there's some wonderful colors. Beautiful yellows and reds and greens. What was that? I heard something. Um, so there's, there are de definitely colors that are changing now in our autumn or our winter, um, our winter months. So it's actually winter now, not really autumn, but um, there's definitely been a change. Um, there are a few trees, however, that stay evergreen um, through the winter, uh, much like the guari tree. Ah, there's some in Yala. There we go. Can you get it through there? Is it good? Look at those in Yala moving through the... Sorry, I'm just trying to get a view of them. Look at that. There we go. Watch the Yala moving through the, the scrub and through those beautiful 
bush willows, lovely colors of the bush willow. Now, Chrissy, you asked what is the difference between Inyala and Irland. Well, there's a huge difference, Chrissy, and let me show you quickly. But firstly, we don't really get Irland in this area, and the Irland is the largest African antelope. Very, very big. And they can get up to about seven or 800 kilograms. Some big males have been measured at 900, or 900 kilograms or a ton. So much, much larger than the Nyala. But the Nyala is much smaller, dark coat, and they've got those spiral horns you saw. The males, the females, much smaller with those prominent white stripes, slightly reddish brown coloration. And then let me show you a picture of an Irland. Now, look at that. Can you see? There we go. Look how big that Irland is. See, massive, massive Irland, uniform brown coloration, big, um, not long horns, but thick set horns, um, but very, very different to that of Inyala. Now, I'm just going to turn the page and show you the Inyala quickly. Uh, that's the Inyala. Look how different they are. You can see shaggy coats, the white stripes down the body. That's the male. Those are the females at the bottom. They look completely different. They look completely different to the, to the Irland. So Chrissy, there we go, hopefully that answers your question. Difference between Inyala and Irland. And again, we don't have Irland here, unfortunately. They do occur in other parts of Kruger. Very shy antelope, for some reason. With them being so big, I've never seen a relaxed Irland. They always run away quite quickly. I'm not sure why. Oh, well, that bit of sun peeking through there is wonderful. And now we can just see all the drops of water glistening in the light. Very, very pretty. Have a look over here, actually. That's quite a nice shot. See if you can. can do you get the glistening drops, Fergs? Or is it, there we go. Look at those glistening drops of water on the leaves. Oh, look, Fergus is, you, you never cease to surprise me and amaze me, Fergus, what he gets on camera. <laughs> very peaceful at the moment, very, very peaceful. You can see that acacia tree with the little thorns on it, those little leaves but sharp thorns. That's a knob thorn, acacia nigrescens. That's what that tree is. Now, this weather doesn't really know what it wants to do because it's now starting to feel a bit warmer because the sun's breaking through. But just that little section of cloud and where we are now. So we've got some sun, sunshine. I'm going to hang around. There goes a little um, uh, crested barbet that just flew past me. A quick glimpse of it. You might have seen it just shoot across the screen. It's nice to sometimes just drive around quietly and just see if we can't hear anything firstly. Uh, some impala ahead of us. Okay, well we're starting to see some wildlife at the moment. The Nyala, the impala, seen a few of them. That terrapin was a nice surprise though. I'm hoping we bump into something else. Uh, James, you asked if there's enough rain for the baboon's tail. Now, there's a, a little baboon tail plant that we have. It's called a baboon's tail, and it looks like a baboon's tail. And he asked if, uh, James asked if there's enough rain for that baboon's tail to pop up. I'm not sure. I don't think so, James, to be honest. I don't think this, 
this light drizzle is enough to get those those little plants to pop up I'm not sure you never know is it a is it a bird is it a plane it's a bird <laughs> Um, can you get him there, Fergs? At the top of that dead tree. Sorry, um, oh no, you know what? I think my angle I've put you in, I think in the poles in the way. Hold on a second. Is it alright? There we go. And you know what that looks like? Our oh, juvenile batelier, it is indeed. The one that we always see around this area. I, th I'm, I mean, I'm not sure if it is the same one, but I would, I would guess so. It does look like the same juvenile batelier. We've been seeing him balancing on the branches um, around here. Now he's finally found a sturdy branch to perch in. And look at him with that light on him at the moment. It's actually a lovely, lovely shot of him. can hear a white-browed scrub robin calling at the moment um, just in the thicket in front of us some great go-away birds calling too There we go, they're those grey go-away birds that I just heard calling and then they just perched at the top of the tree. Mohammed, you asked, have I ever seen a Pels fishing owl? No, Mohammed, I haven't, unfortunately, not yet. A Pels fishing owl, everyone, is a large owl. The lar I think it's the largest owl that we have. Um, it's very close to, in size to the giant eagle owl or the Varroa's eagle owl. Um, brown in color. I'll try to find a photo for you quickly. Brown in color, but they um, these birds are quite elusive, and they're only found in certain areas. And they're called the Pell's fishing owl because they hunt fish. Oh, let me show you a picture of one. Uh, let's see. That, that that's a that's a decent picture, I think. Can you see that, Fergs? There we go. You hold it uh, on the back there. Is that better? Yeah. Right, there we go. There we go. Probably Pell's fishing owl. Very brown in colour but very, very big. And they do swoop down and catch fish out of the water. Um, but no, I've never seen one. Like I said, only certain areas and you do have to look very, very carefully for this bird. I've seen one. Have you seen one? Yeah. Wow, Ferg's has seen one. Right, so I'm not going to talk to Fergs anymore for a while. Let's head across to Tristan, who's trying to track a male leopard. <laughs> we are indeed, and well, not succeeding at this stage. I see where the vehicles have been driving around here, but I can't see... Is that his tracks crossing over? It is too. So he's crossed into Buffelshook right here. So his tracks are just on my right hand side. Now unfortunately because of the roof it's going to be very difficult to show you these tracks but I will try. But that's about as typical as it goes for Tingana I'm afraid. He likes to do things like this. So I'm going to try and just see if I can't position the vehicle. I need a bit of sunlight on them otherwise you're not going to be able to see them. But Craig can you see? I'm going to try get out and try and show Craig but there might be a bar in the way. Let's try and have a look here. Oh, leaving my mic pack behind but over here right there or over there is another one can you see them Greg no just so here is the front foot of him and then the back foot and then unfortunately quite a few vehicles have driven over he's then gone across and maybe this one Craig I don't know you can tell me if you can see it there's another one there that indicates that he's gone over that side. So we know his tracks just because of the size of the track. It's quite a large sort of 
footprint and being a big male it can only be him coming from Biffles Hook Dam so he's definitely crossed northwards into Biffles Hook which is quite typical for Tingana. <sighs> One of those afternoons I think it might be so we'll just have to try and see maybe he comes back this way a little bit later but I definitely need to let the other guys know that his tracks cross here because there's quite a few guys that are looking for him in this area. Abel, Abel, Abel. And I'm surprised because he's just come off a big carcass so I would have thought that he would have been happy just to lie down at the water's edge and spend the day there but in weather like this I suppose it's cool enough that he can move around and we know Tingana likes to cover distance and so it could in all sort of likelihood just be that he just wants to go and check out more of his territory and go and see what's going on. But uh, I was hoping he was going to be there. Oh well, onward and forward we go, we just have to keep trying. It's the only thing we can do, it's not the end of the world. Be nice if we got some tracks though that we could follow up on because it's otherwise been very quiet the last sort of two days and very little to actually keep us motivated and following up. But we will keep trying. Able, able, able. Uh, it seems like no one wants to talk to us either. Oh, that's why, it's because I don't have my earpiece plugged in. Naughty me. Sorry, Alice, as well. Alice is in FC today, so... Ah, there we go, they can copy me. Well, it's because I had my earpiece out. Uh, tracks for this uh, male leopard goes north towards this jackalberry um, in this little drainage section uh, from those mud wallows. You'll see I circled the tracks. So, unfortunately, that's it. Now, you firm, they've crossed north into Buffles Hook. Uh, you'll see where I circled them, just drive on the cut line. So, it's always good when on a cut line like this and trying to sort of follow up on tracks and especially when you're working with other guys the, the important thing is always just to circle the last one so that when the guys come that they don't miss them and they're able to see where they are so it's an important sort of technique to get into the habit of right well it sounds like Byron is still birding so let's go across to him and see what feathery friends he's managed to find now Unfortunately nothing, the only thing I've managed to find is some guests on safari, they've just passed us, um, they are also looking for animals and hopefully they have some luck though this afternoon, they look quite bundled up on the vehicle, but look at that, look at that beautiful dark sky at the moment, I'm just going to stop because that is quite beautiful, really really beautiful, like I said I think uh, for photography this light this beautiful light at the moment in the dark skies I would really like to photograph it I actually don't have my camera with me at the moment oh dear A rookie error <clears throat> oh, Pamela now you ask if guides take photography as part of the job, um, so so some some guides do, Pamela. And I think um, nowadays, with um, with being a guide, it's actually quite important to know uh, a bit about cameras and um, and a bit about photography because everybody that comes out on safari nowadays wants to try and get good images of the the sightings that they have, whether it's a small point and shoot camera that they have or a big SLR um, a larger camera um, that you know everybody wants to get some good images so I think it is important for a guide to know a bit about photography I've been dealing or, or doing a bit of photography for many years now um, now I don't uh, I don't um, claim to be a professional photographer but I help a lot of guests and um, and hopefully help them get great images and then take some shots myself which which I enjoy now speaking about photography I'm very jealous because the guys in the Mara are out at the moment and they've got one of my other favorite animals let's go and have a look it's a big surprise 
Well, I think maybe Byron and I should have a photo competition. But here we go. Look at this. It was so very special. Live from Kenya. A black rhino. Now, he was a bit closer to us earlier. And he was looking at us quite, quite evilly over the grass. But he's wandered off to go munch uh, down on the edge of the Sheeny Forest. So, very, very, very cool. Look at his ears. It looks like a young bull to me. Um, he's a bit far away to be 100% sure. There he is. Hello, mister. Dear, it sounds like the signal's a little bit jumpy there in the Morris side. Hopefully they get it up and running again soon. Um, I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. Let's, um, we'll see, we'll see. Now, I'm jealous and as I said because they got to see a rhino that's always wonderful to see and it's great that they're able to show you a rhino up in the Mara at the moment Wow, this light is beautiful Uh, Chitty Chatty, Meg, you asked how many lodges are close to the Juma Research Camp where we stay. Well, um, have a look here. Hold on. There's a beautiful water buck in the afternoon sun. Look at that backlit water buck. Just off to our right, a female. Now, Chitty Chatty, Meg. Um, Juma, Juma has um, two, two camps. So um, there's uh, Vuya Tela and Galago. Those are two little camps. Um, that the the public are able to book into, but those those camps are so, um, are basically booked out as 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 an entire camp. You have to book out the whole camp as a group. So um, I think ten people for Vuyatela and about eight for Galago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so those are right next door to us. Um, those are the two camps here. And then um, then the other camps around this area, northern Sabu Sands, is Simbambili, Arethusa, Chitwa Chitwa. Uh, Cheetah Plains uh, and Koro and uh, Elephant Plains. So there are a few different uh, lodges around this area, just in the northern Sabi Sands. But within the Sabi Sands, I think there's about 26 or 28 commercial lodges altogether. Um, so there are quite a number of them. All slightly different and all depends what you're looking for and um, and where you're going to be going but the game viewing generally within the Sabi Sands is is very good I think uh, some areas obviously some areas uh, the, the um, properties have got big rivers flowing through them so maybe uh, more wildlife moving through those areas um, like the Sand River and the Sabi River in the south Look at those clouds now. Isn't that lovely? The scenery at the moment really is spectacular. Very beautiful afternoon. Even though it's a bit cold and windy, just the color and the light in the sky with the clouds. Those shaggy coats of the waterbuck. Very strange antelope. You can just see a bit of that white ring around the rump on the side. And white marking.
very beautiful light in that water back. Now, Mareka, you asked if um, if this dry season will be as bad as the last one. Now, I don't think so. It doesn't look like it. We had very good rains this year, and um, and I don't think the drought will be as bad as it was last year, or the dry season, rather. Not drought. I don't think we're going to have a drought this year. Look, it's definitely going to get a lot drier as we move into July, August, September. It will get much drier, but there's still a lot of vegetation and water around at the moment. And this little bit of drizzle, I mean, it. this wouldn't have made a big difference, but maybe we get some rain from this. Or oh, another, another storm in the winter. It, it does happen from time to time, a bit of rain. That's a really lovely sighting. Now I think we'll um we'll move on. And we're going to I think let's head down towards Chitwa Dam. We're not too far. I think this light, this afternoon light on the dam could be quite special. Maybe we have a beautiful crocodile out. Although this cold weather, I don't know, I don't think so. I don't think there'd be anything basking. But let's let's have a look anyway. Maybe some hippo in the water. Maybe there's some animals in the clearings. Fish eagle out in the light, the golden light. Let's see. Did you see? Oh, a beautiful barbet in the light. Hopefully it stays there. Hold on, I just want to show you this bird quickly. Ah, oh, stay there. <laughs> oh, obviously it flew off. Beautiful crested barbet. But in the light you can see the colors beautifully. Alright, well let's head back to Tristan who's furiously searching for Tingana apparently. Well, no, but I'm not searching for Tingana because we can't search for Tingana. He's gone northwards over the boundary and therefore we can't see him anymore as we described in our last segment. But since then, we've also tracked a very fresh herd of elephants and saw all we saw was a tail going into Torchwood. So it's going to be one of those days where, well, everything just decides to go the opposite direction to where we wanted them to be. And so, so far, no luck on the leopard, no luck on the elephants. And we will continue to try and see what else we can find. It's just been tough afternoon so far. Batman, why are you chasing all the animals? You're sorry. You should be sorry, Batman. We want to see the animals. We don't want to just find tracks and bottom ends disappearing into bushes. Hopefully there'll be something out. I'm now going to try and zigzag my way through the sort of eastern parts of Juma all the way to the west and I'm going to pray for some sort of miracle that maybe Mr. Mvula pops out on the western side or shadow because it would be really nice to get a spotted cat and unfortunately Tingana's thwarted our efforts. Now let's see if we can't just go this way and maybe just maybe we might find a bull elephant lagging behind the herd if we carry on on this direction. Like I said I just saw the tail end of them crossing out into Torchwood so maybe there might be a bull behind them it's a long shot, but you never know. Sometimes it's worth just trying and just seeing if you can't get some sort of sight of them. And it looks very ominous to our south at the moment. It doesn't look very pleasant at all. And I'm hoping that's not going to come in this way because there are dark, dark, dark clouds behind us. And in fact, I might just turn around quickly just so you can see them. And then I'll do a little loop back. So hold on, because we can't swivel the camera too much because of the sort of amount of rain covers we have on. But look at that for an ominous sky to the south. Does that not look 
like rain on its way. It's dark, it's almost got that black-blue color, and you can even see the haziness of the rain to our south. So it looks like it might get quite wet and quite sort of miserable out here at some point. So, Mike, you say the skies over here look like anaconda skies. Well, yes, they do. They're, they're looking quite mean today, and it's not something that we really look forward to when we see that, because it often means that we're going to have a very wet afternoon on the vehicles, and as much as these roofs help and all these rain covers that we have, it still doesn't stop us from actually getting pretty drenched out here. So hopefully that stays there. It's welcome to stay over Mala Mala and the southern parts of the Sabi Sands, and we'll happily take the sunshine that is now glorifying the landscape and so hopefully that will also mean that the animals will move from there to here and we can all just be wishful thinking in terms of all of that but I don't think we've got much of a chance because the wind is blowing straight this way and now actually now that the wind's blowing I don't know if you're gonna be able to get this Craig but you, if you can try on this dead tree that you see here there is a bird just sitting oh no it's not going to work because the roof's in the way unfortunately but there is a lilac breasted roller that looked very pretty in this afternoon and in this beautiful light but unfortunately my roof is in the way so I'm gonna to have to try and reposition which means it'll probably fly away but Byron is with some gray water and lots and lots of big animals in it <laughs> yes Tristan well we've got a whole pot of hippo in Chitra Dam we've just got here the light is starting to disappear a little bit behind some clouds and I don't see any sign of the fish eagle that's usually here but the hippo are enjoying the water look at those two youngsters oh look at that <laughs> look at that really really young hippo wonderful look how small it is compared to that adult wow now often what the young hippo do is they'll try and balance on the backs of the adult and hold their heads up on their back to keep their heads above water and balance ah oh, that one at the back's very cute look at that <laughs> that's wonderful and they're not just dipping under water oh look there yeah there we go see that young one's doing exactly that on the back of the mother just to help balance and keep its head above the water and oh, there it goes Nice to see young hippo with the pod like this. The two young ones. Now, Stevie, if there wasn't it wasn't any water around, the animals would definitely. I'm sure they would most likely die from um, from lack of water. The animals do all need water. Yes, they do find water, as we've seen with the elephants. They dig up in the riverbeds, uh, the dry riverbeds. They'll dig holes and find water. But um, but if there's no water in these dams and that, that just means the water level would have dropped. The water table would have dropped substantially. And then it's unlikely that these animals would even be able to dig for water. That would then just be catastrophic and the animals will end up dying. They do need water. All the animals need water. And if there wasn't water, it would be a major, major disaster. Now, the last drought that we had um, last year... The drought doesn't necessarily just mean there's no water around. The drought also means that there's lack of food. So what happens is because the, of the very little rain that we had last year, not a lot of vegetation grew. So in the winter, when the winter months, the dry months arrived, then there was very, very little to no food. I've never seen the Sabi Sands that dry before. There was hardly any grass on the clearings. The trees were all bare. It was, it was really, really bad. There were still little... Um, uh, areas of water, Chitra Dam still had water um, but however if there's water but no food that also will result in animals dying they need food too, they can't just survive off water so um, so drought doesn't necessarily just mean that there's no water the drought will also mean that there's no food but fortunately um, the animals do survive they're a lot hardier than we think they are 
They can survive really bad, rough conditions. They are prepared for it. And they're resilient. It's also survival of the fittest, really. Girl of Fire, you asked if uh, if the hippos come out of the water when it's cold. So not necessarily like today. It was it was really cold, so they they choose to stay in the water. But at night they will still go off and feed, and they need to because they need the they need the food. Um, but generally in winter, when it's those warm sunny days, the hippo and the crocodiles they bask on the banks of the dams or the water holes to warm up. But Today it was really cold, so I think that's why they all stayed in the water. No need to come out of the water. There's no sun to bask in. But at night, the hippo will still definitely move around and go and find some food. And no, the hippo actually do not give birth in the water. The hippo will leave the water and they'll give birth just outside, close to the water. But they'll give birth outside and then return to the water a little bit later once the calf has managed to find its feet and move around a bit. Then the, the female will take it into some shallow water and keep it safe. But they actually give birth out of water. There we go. There's a little one. <coughs> Just generally, the mother hippos will give birth to a single calf at a time. And um, gestation period, if I'm not... Oh, no, let me double check before I second guess myself. I think it's about 9 or 10 months uh, gestation period for a hippo. Oh, I better be right. Let me double check. And I may need the girls in the office to, um, to give me some help. Working this out. Let me just see now. Where is hippo? All right. So a hippo gestation period is about 220 to 250 days. Okay. So what is that? Is that is that nine months? Oh, eight months? Nine months? I'll ask the maths buffins in the. About eight months. There we go. So I asked the math boffins, maths boffins in um, in final control to help me out there. So about eight months, nine months, almost nine months. So that's a gestation period of a hippo, and um, so I was right. Thank goodness. Sure. Um, they they then had one calf, and I'm not sure exactly how many calves a female will give birth to during her lifespan. I, I really don't know because they look after the calves for quite a number of years before they decide to mate again. Maybe if, uh, three or four years and then mate again and potentially have another one. But also it takes them a few years to reach sexual maturity. And a hippo will generally live to about, uh, I think a hippo lives to about uh, 30 or 40 years, I think. We can double check that. Maybe someone at home can double check if there's a lifespan on a hippo. I think it's about 30 or 40 years. Um, am I, am I sh overshooting a little bit? I wonder if that's a bit long for a hippo. I, th I think so, though. So if one of, one of you back home can find out and let us know, don't forget, send us your comments and questions. Hashtag Safari Live. Um, you can comment or... And let's see the lifespan of a hippo. Maybe we can work out how many calves they give birth to in a in a lifespan. Lal, I'm not sure. You asked if hippo have been known to drown. I don't know. I would think, and I, w I would hazard a guess, maybe with big flash floods. There's very there's a possibility that a hippo's drowned, perhaps. The flash flood comes down and washes a hippo away, perhaps, but I don't know. I've never heard of a hippo drowning. Now, we do know they need to lift their heads up and gasp for air, but they can, with a single gasp, they can stay down 
for quite some time with a single breath of air they can stay down for quite some time anywhere between seven and nine minutes if they really push it but generally on average it's about two two to three minutes that they stay underwater for Oh, uh, Natalie and Izzy, so you say a hippo might indeed live to about 40 to 50 years. So, yeah, I was, I was close there with 40 years. Um, but, wow, a 50-year-old hippo, that sounds pretty old. That's amazing. So maybe, also, you know, sometimes you need to take into consideration animals in captivity might live a bit longer than others. So I, I always, I'm always a bit wary at, as um, where the, the information comes from, how long they can live. But lifespan... A lifespan can be about uh, about that. That's amazing. Yeah. So I'm sure they'll have a number of calves during that time. Now speaking of the living for long periods of time, Brent's still got an animal that can live to about 40 to 45 years. Let's go and have a look. special this is we're still with this beautiful beautiful creature and uh, as I say I think it looks like a young bull to me isn't he wonderful uh, hopefully the gremlins stay away this time we are live from the Maasai Mara in Kenya and we're with the endangered black rhino isn't this absolutely awesome remember hashtag safari live if you've got any questions for us this is so exciting I've spent my whole afternoon with this guy and he's come closer he's gone away and now he's starting to move a bit closer to us again hey though they do always look a little grumpy can't really help it now often here it looks like the rhino are feeding on grass and of course black rhino don't eat grass they eat leaves and there we go you can see he's actually just picked up a little bush a little twig uh, from a small bush that's growing in the grass James, James is uh, wondering what is the average territory size for a black rhino bull and again it all depends on what area you're in um, but they can be very very big and up to sort of I know black rhino bulls that used to travel sort of 10,000 hectares uh, but it can be as small as a thousand or two thousand hectares sorry that's my radio I was embarrassing myself earlier trying to call this in in Swahili you the only thing I really love about black rhinos they always look like they're on the verge of action they're sort of this pent-up ball of energy hey oh, and I say we've, we've been sitting with him since about four o'clock uh, we just haven't left it's just been so wonderful to spend time with these animals I haven't spent a lot of time in quite a few years with black rhino since they're coming over oh no, it's, oh, it's flown out of the way thank you Well, unfortunately, it's still trying to iron out all those gremlins in Mara, and so every now and then we're going to get an issue. But now, our problem is, is that we're in an area where gremlins are going to be living, and so it might break up as well, because here in front is Gremlin Hollow. This is not a place you want to spend too much time in a vehicle. We're just going through this little dip on Yala Road North, and it often gets quite sort of breaky up here. So I'm going to try and see if I can't just edge forward and edge through it. And if there is a little bit of a breakup, I do apologize as we move through. Should not be too bad. We should be able to just sneak through this little section and then be able to get out of here. And I was just listening to the radio trying to see anybody commenting on no sign of him. North. 
you so we don't lose you all and we'll quickly go across to Byron who seems to be the only one with signal at this stage all right well it sounds like Tristan's bumbling around trying to fight was it was you, you with Tristan there now um, I thought it was Brent I think there's a heron though a green-backed heron uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. How fast is that? Well done, though. There's a green backed heron and that just flew past us uh, over the water. Oh, that's what that was. Uh, uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> no, people will get frightened if they digital zoom on my face, I'm sure. Now we're still sitting at the uh, at the dam, just seeing if there's any other activity. It's actually quite pleasant here. It's very peaceful. Um, so Ferg Fergus and I have just been enjoying the serenity of the dam, Chitra Dam. Hey, look at that! Mm, nice In day. touch with our sensitive side. Alright, now, aka, you've asked about this bird nest in the tree. Now, that is a nest built by red billed buffalo weavers. Uh, I will show you a picture shortly, but those red billed buffalo weavers build those big nests that they, um, they, uh, basically community nesting birds. So you'll have a number of bird species in those, uh, no, sorry, not a number of bird species, a number of of birds from the red bull buffalo weaver family in that in that nest they do share there might be and I've read um, I've read some interesting things regarding the buffalo weavers occasionally you may have a number of females and one male um, or you may have a number of um, pairs also just sharing the nest let me just find it red bull buffalo weaver Please don't ask me why it's called a buffalo weaver because I have no idea. <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe. What's the buffalo thorn? Fergus says maybe it's got something to do with the buffalo thorn. What do they use the buffalo thorn? Um, uh, the, to the sticks in the nest? Yeah, oh, possibly. That's I, I don't know actually. I don't know that. That would make sense, Fergus. Um, now that's the bird. Very very beautiful red beak. Red bull and black and white on uh, mainly black with a bit of white on it. That's a red bull buffalo weaver. I just want to read something here quickly. Let me just uh, see if I can find uh, something regarding the breeding. Uh, colonial breeder with both polygamous and cooperative breeding systems. Okay, so that's quite yeah. So exactly. Um, uh, number of uh, number of birds sharing the nests. Okay, and then, yeah, nest a bulky structure of thorny twigs. So that would make sense then, as Fergus was saying, possibly using the buffalo weaver, sorry, the buffalo buffalo thorn tree as uh, as nest material. And that obviously just aids in protection against, against any uh, predators, potential predators. Now, predators would include the African harrier hawk, like the one we saw this morning. Well, I've actually seen one raiding a nest here before, trying to break open the nest to get to the chicks. Uh, but also, because they build them in the tops of trees that are in the water, it's unlikely for snakes to get to them or, or other creatures. I've seen um, water monitors actually climbing up trees to get to the nest. They can, uh, they can, um, they can at least uh, climb up into a tree and raid the nest looking for chicks. Uh, the um, water monitors. Now I think I might just move on from the dam now, and uh, see what else we can find. And while I do that, it sounds like Brent has moved away from that wonderful rhino he got to see, but he still wants to chat to you a little bit. Well, unfortunately, that black rhino has headed off into the forest to go have a nibble there. And uh, my name is Brent Smith. I have Senzo M Keys on a camera. And uh, we're going to go meander, see what else we can do. Such a privilege to be able to spend time with one of the most endangered large mammals in the world. Now, as I was saying, these rhinos are very, very well monitored. And you'll see shortly as I drive past some of the park guards um, who will keep an eye out daily on those incredible creatures. Here we go. Bumpity, bumpity, bumpity. Now, I hope 
we've, uh, seems like we've fixed all the problems in Paka, but she's on the test today to see, make sure that we've managed to get all the little kinks out, but so far she's purring, running like a dream. Remember to send questions through to hashtag Safari Live. So there we go, these gentlemen are making sure that those rhino are safe. Habari! Santa Sana! Bye day! So there we go, watching the rhinos constantly, making sure they are safe. Okay, where to next? What other incredible things are out there? I think it's time for some birding. Kitty, kitty, bang, bang. Kitty, kitty, bang, bang. Would like to know whether I've ever witnessed a rhino charge, a vehicle, or a person. Uh, both. And both me. <laughs> I've, I've climbed, black rhinos have put me up trees more than once. Uh, I used to work in an area of the Kruger, and uh, we had awesome black rhino there. And we used to go track them on foot, and they come and you just look for a tree. Now, I'm not convinced that they're actually just charging or they're just running in a direction that you might be in. And I just think that their eyesight is quite bad. Their hearing is very good, however. Like mine, so I'm switching off the beepity 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 radio. So what have I been? Oh, I've been looking for an ash, no, a sooty chat for some time and they keep avoiding me while I'm live. I see many while I'm not live. Um, let's see. This is a good, it's a good spot. Some nice grass, some termitarias. That's what Suti chats. Whee! Slippy mud. We've got some elephants just up ahead. Let's see, oh, they're going into the forest. I'll try to find some Ellie's a little bit closer, but it sounds like Tristan's also on a birding mission. Well, we are, Brent. It's because all the animals don't want to be anywhere near us today, so they all moved away. So we decided, well, we'll turn our attention to our feathered friends, and they're being far more obliging in this cold weather. And you can see these two beautiful green pigeons which must be some of the most beautiful pigeons in the world in terms of their coloration are all fluffed up and trying to stay as warm as possible on this dead tree I don't think they've chosen the best spot because they must be very exposed up there and there must be a cold breeze that is hitting them and that's why they're all puffy like that they're just trying to get some sort of warmth going and so all their feathers are trapping air and you can imagine it must act like a, almost like a jersey by trapping that air and keeping it in amongst the feathers and then the body heat just doesn't get lost nearly as fast so those are two very fat very fluffy pigeons at this stage and I say that they are some of the most beautiful pigeons in the world because they're, their color they've got that olivey color and then with those bright colors around their faces now Tula Ann, hello Tula Ann and happy birthday for the other day. I didn't wish you so I hope you've had a, had a good birthday the other day and that you are enjoying being five years old and you want to know where the doggies went. Well the wild dogs unfortunately they didn't want to play with us this morning so they all got up and they ran after they had breakfast and they ran all the way eastwards towards the Kruger National Park and I don't know where they are this afternoon because nobody's found them yet. They were moving very fast towards the boundary and maybe they might have even gone into the Kruger Park so unfortunately for us there's no sign of the doggies this afternoon which is a pity because I like seeing the wild dogs and it sounds like you do too and they're fun aren't they they like to run around and play and I was hoping that we were going to see more of them this afternoon but alas maybe we'll find them later you never know with wild dogs it's always a chance and Byron's down near Chitwa and sometimes they can come out and go towards the dam so maybe Byron will be lucky a little bit later Right, onward and forward I think. Let's leave our two green pigeons huddled and trying to just stay nice and warm and see what other feathered friends we can find in this miserable weather because I don't think our mammal friends are giving us much of a chance today. They all seem to be hiding from me or moving in the wrong direction. So we'll try and see if we can't focus our attention on the feathered ones instead. I'm still very surprised that that big dark cloud hasn't come over because the wind has been howling from the south 
and yet that cloud has not arrived it almost seems as though it's shifted a little bit further to the east which is good news for us because it means we're not getting rained upon and so I'm quite happy about that ah there's another one of our feathered friends two of our feathered friends the one just flew off unfortunately but oh no and you're also going to fly off and perch in a place that we can't see you so there's a forktail drongo just below the roof there oh no don't it was perfectly placed right out in the open of course but now because we want to show you you've now gone to where the roof is it seems like this is going to be a curse this afternoon although our hornbills are being far more cooperative they're busy digging around for food scraps so there's two red billed hornbills that are on the edge of the road hey guys what are you doing in there see how they're picking off insects off of the grass now these guys must be having a tough time of it you know the last few times I've been tracking and walking around the insect life is far less than what we were seeing a few months ago and so these guys must be really having to try hard to find food well oh, Cape Turtle Dove is now joined there goes our forktail drongo flying off and so we've got hornbills Cape Turtle Dove drongo sounds like there are some green wood hoopoos around as well I can hear them in the distance and then Craig if you can just check just to the right of the hornbill in a small tree that's just on the edge of the road there yes straight in the middle of your frame down 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 so that's the drongo that flew up there but there's another little tree just below it there now there was a bird bouncing oh where did it go now there was a bird in there I think it was a chagra that might have been sitting inside there but alas it's flown away it would have been nice to see the chagra so for those of you who don't know what the chagra looks like I'm going to try and find it for you in two ticks. Let's see if I've got the right page. It should be around here somewhere. Come on, Tristan. Thrushes, chagras should be here. Why have I not found it? This is typical. When you're looking for something, then you battle. There we go. So what we were looking for is either one of these two birds. So we've got the brown crown chagra that is also quite common here. And you see it's got that very sort of brown cap to it with that black line that goes through the eyes and then a whitish sort of throat and short beak. Whereas the other one that we see in this particular area is this black crown chagra. And this is the one we see probably mostly. It has a very nice call. It sounds like somebody that is whistling in the bush and walking around and just making this kind of whistle sound. I quite like this song that they sing. And so those are the two that we see quite often. And it was one of those that I think was sitting in that bush and then flew away. Right. Our bird party has left us. Onward and forward we go. Right. Now, Byron, who is driving around and was at Chitwan, had his pod of hippos. And not sure if he found a crocodile there, but he seems to be battling to find anything. And so Alice has suggested, Byron, that you also start your attention on doing some birding. Well, I think so, Tristan. We'll try some birding. I'm still on Chitra Chitra at the moment. Just driving around, scanning the clearings, hoping that we find something. But so far, nothing. Well, that's not good. That's not good. But we'll see. Maybe we find some something around here. Oh dear, these clearings are looking very, very quiet. Very quiet. And you asked if uh, bush fires are common here. Now they're not. They're not that common, but. Um, but they do they do occur and especially in the winter they're going moving through the later months um, of the year into uh, July August uh, September then uh, yes bushfires can occur and we've got to be very careful of them because the bushfires uh, basically what happens is the thunder and lightning with the lightning we might get some bushfires that have started now look at these pretty birds that I've found Stay there, don't run. Too soon to panic. Calm down. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole group of guinea fowl, everyone. Look at them. That's so nice. Nice to see the guinea fowl. 
they're actually very pretty birds there's some young ones you can see the darker faces the adults have the blue with the red on top these are helmeted guinea fowl that's what they're called there's a lot of them here <laughs> look at them go they actually look quite prehistoric don't they I mean, with that, that kind of helmet on their head and <laughs> They're off to war, I don't know. Now the guinea fowl are great to have around because they alarm call at any predators. Uh, now, Chitty Chatty Meg, you asked if birds lay eggs without mating. Uh, not that I know of. Um, as far as I know, all the birds have to mate. I don't know about them not laying eggs or laying eggs without mating. I, I don't think so, Chitty Chatty Meg. I've never, never heard of birds laying eggs without mating. If I'm wrong, I do apologize. But I've, as far as I know, out here in nature, the birds have to mate for them to lay eggs. To fertilize the eggs correctly. There's also a few impala walking around here. Yeah, this is the airstrip of Chitwa Chitwa. Oh, there's some impala running through. Look, there they go. Don't know what startled them. They just decided to run through. There's one still standing, so it can't be anything serious. But look at that, that's nice. Marsha, you asked, is the, um, is the scarcity of animals uh, usual for this time of year? Well, uh, not necessary. You know what the thing is, Marsha, is that the animals move around. We need to remember, this is a huge, huge area. And, um, and the animals will move around, depending on the time of year. They'll move into different areas, looking for food, looking for water, um, whatever the case may be. But also... Their territories are really large, and their territories extend beyond the boundaries of, of Juma or Chitra Chitra for that matter. All the areas that we cover, and they'll maybe move back in towards the Kruger, up into the Manialeti. Look at those two young males sparring. That's just playful behavior. Nothing serious. You can see they are young male impala. So, Marsha, yeah, it... Um, Right. The, with the changing of the season, you do get seasonal movements of animals within these areas, but they're always around, and um, and you never know. Tomorrow we could drive out and come across lions and leopards and cheetah and wild dog. That's the thing out here is you never really know, but all those animals are around, and we see their tracks. We see tracks of the wild dogs. Um, we've seen tracks of leopards. It's just been very difficult for us to find them at the moment. I don't know why but um, it just that's just the way it goes sometimes but don't worry we won't give up I promise <laughs> we'll still try try our best to find the animals for all of you well some of the predators we're still at least finding these beautiful antelope and the elephant <laughs> that's actually great to watch isn't it And the guinea fowl in the background. That's a nice shot there, look at that. Atul, now you asked you asked an interesting question. Uh, it's sometimes a difficult difficult subject, but uh, you asked if the if the park and um, the Kruger National Park sometimes cull um, some of the herbivores um, because of the of the area. So at the moment, from my understanding, they they don't they don't have to because um, because there is a natural system, natural environment. The drought would have also um, 
thinned the numbers somewhat. All the weaker animals would have been, or would have died during the drought last year. Um, so they aren't necessarily um, culls that that need to go on. Um, the Kruger Park uh, years ago did they did have to cull a few numbers, um, perhaps in parlor and that um, you know just uh, sheer numbers increasing too much, and it's always it's always difficult. But you know the and that goes hand in hand with the land man or management systems that national parks do around um, Africa. It's all over Africa. It's not just here. And um, but I think for the last little while they haven't had to do culls for a long time in the national parks because there is a natural balance. The predators are doing their jobs correctly. Um, the impala are st staying in check. And um, it was interesting that I was just in an area where um, where the game reserve is actually it's a fairly new game reserve. And it's uh, it's up in the northwestern part of South Africa, um, in the Northern Cape. And this game reserve actually has two sections to it. It's very very large. It's about a hundred thousand hect, hundred and fifteen thousand hectares. Now, to give you an idea, that is double the size of the Sabi Sands that we are in. So we're just in a portion of the Sabi Sands, the Juma, but um, the Sabi Sands is sixty thousand hectares. And um, and um, anyway, so it's double the size of the Sabi Sands. Now, those that area has a fence running between it, and animals, antelope, and that on one side, um, with some predators, but smaller predators, and then um, lions and that on the other side. Now, the overgrazing which has occurred in on the side without the lions is incredible to see, and it's amazing to see the role the lions play in moving animals around certain areas to prevent overgrazing and so they play a huge ecological role in hunting thinning out the numbers and preventing overgrazing so they do a wonderful job for the ecosystem so it's interesting so that's what happens within the kruger too you have lions you have all these other predators they constantly move animals around so there is a natural balance and a natural ecosystem so hopefully the culling doesn't have to happen now speaking of lions, our friend Brent has managed to find some up in the Mara. Welcome back to the magical Mara and from the Black Rhino we've bumbled a little bit down the road and we've got what seems to be all seven of the Angama cubs. Remember this is 100% live coming to you from Kenya. Uh, you can ask me questions on Twitter by using the hashtag Safari Live. So uh, Byron was just chatting about how the lions thin out the herbivores. Well, their moms have not been doing a good job. We watched them this morning miss three times while they missed a, a waterbuck, a topi, and some warthog. So moms haven't been doing the best job this morning, but hopefully for the cubs they'll catch something today. So there we go, the little Angama cubs. I can see one, two, three, four, five. I'm sure the other two are also not too far around, all just flat. Oh, there's another one, that's six, uh, in the long grass. Now, it's not uncommon for lions to leave their cubs by themselves while they head off hunting. Cubs tend to ruin most of the hunts. They pop their head up at the wrong time, decide to tackle mom when the hunt is on. So generally by a fierce growl uh, will keep the cubs in this position while the females go out hunting. Now when we're about a kilometre to two kilometres, maybe a little bit more, from where we left the lionesses this morning after their unsuccessful search for bacon on, uh, the, uh, in the morning. So who knows? I don't think they would have moved too far. I think they're probably sleeping around there. They're waiting for it to get a bit cooler before they start heading out on the hunt again. Hello, cutie. I'm cubs are just too wonderful. And as I said this morning, we're going to be getting to know these prides intimately over time. And uh, this is a pride we will be spending a long, a lot of time with, the Angama pride. So uh, they range sometimes all the way up below final control, uh, but normally they spend their time down here on the grasslands and it's a very good territory because it's got a lot of food in it, a lot of pigs and of course the wildebeest are coming. Mm. 
Okay, so I've got a little little game to play with you. So the Moro Triangle is about fifty thousand hectares, which is just over a hundred thousand acres. And just in the Moro Triangle, who can guess how many lions there are? So who can guess how many lions there are in the Moro Triangle? That is, of course, not the whole Ma Maasai Mara. It is just uh, the side to the west of the river. Who can guess roughly? How many lions there are in the Mara Triangle? Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Now I have a rust estimate. I'm not looking for an exact number. Just a rough estimate of how many lions there are. Now, Joshua is wondering about spotted kitties. Well, we've got some spotted kitties next to us. Of course, the little lion cubs uh, have a spot while they're young, and that's to help them hide from other predators. I'm just going to move forward a tiny bit. Uh, Joshua is, of course, talking about leopards and wondering about the, the leopard population. The leopard, oh, isn't that sweet? Look at that little face peering at us. Hey, little guy. Hello. Sorry, Joshua, I got sidetracked by the lion cub. And uh, it, Joshua, it's a very healthy leopard population in the Mara. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact densities just yet. But, uh, Oh dear, I don't know what happened there with the signal, but now we're just still sitting on this, um, on the airstrip, just listening out to see if we can't hear any, any alarm calls perhaps, but also what I'd like to show you, I'm going to reposition quickly, because the light at the moment and the sky is really spectacular behind us, and I think we might get a beautiful sunset. Let me just go 